Here is a beautiful image of Alex Gleason's 1892 New Standard Map of the World that was on projection at Modern College in Blackheath, England. It states at the top of the map that it is scientifically and practically correct. The way Gleason's map significantly differs from standard maps of the world is in its representation of the poles. As you can see by comparison with a conventional world map, the primary difference in Gleason's map is that the North Pole is actually situated in the centre of the Earth and upon first glance the South Pole, or what is known as Antarctica, appears to be missing. Upon closer inspection, however, you realise that Antarctica is indeed present and makes up the majority of landmass on the map. Antarctica in Gleason's map is an encompassing ice ring that covers the entire outer reaches of Earth. Gleason's map has become somewhat of a canonical historical document for flat earthers. Many often reposting the image on the internet and heralding it as solid proof that refutes a heliocentric model of the Earth. Or in other words, proving that the Earth is not a spinning globe in space, but a circular, flat and stationary plane. This was not enough proof for me. And while I gravitated towards the idea of a giant encompassing an ice wall as a neat concept, I knew that we had a vast amount of evidence proving the existence of space, spherical planets and entire sciences dedicated to solving the mathematical conundrums of physics. I mean we landed on the moon for God's sake. Surely if the earth was flat and stationary then somebody would have realised by now. These brave souls did the unthinkable. They flew to the moon, they landed, took their first cautionary steps and planted the American flag. NASA sent multiple crews to the moon on subsequent Apollo missions. They even managed to film Apollo 17 leaving the moon. Four stage, pushed. Engine arm is out Okay, I'm gonna get the pro. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one. Ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your good. Back but wait, five. hold on. If this is footage of the crew leaving the moon and making the journey back to Earth, then who did they leave behind to film their craft take off? And wait, don't you think those colourful emissions on takeoff look kind of fake? I haven't seen any subsequent rockets produce these sort of dazzling colours. And I suppose they did admit that they had lost all their data from the mission. But maybe that was just coincidence. I started looking into NASA a bit more closely, and what I found was shocking. I can say with certainty that NASA is indeed lying to the world, and has been lying ever since its founding in 1958. But don't take my word for it. Sometimes you can't tell people the truth, you have to show them. So let me show you. Buckle up and sit tight, because Houston, we have a big problem. Okay, well, um, there's a big problem with the blue marble. And I'm going to zoom in here and show you what the problem is. These are all composite images where they are really not very good at Photoshop because they're using the Photoshop clone tool to replicate clouds. This cloud is a copy of this cloud. See the formations? They're identical. Identical formations. These right here, side by side, side by side. See, see this kind of W looking shape right here, replicated right here. This cloud is exactly the same as that cloud. Um, you know, same clouds right there and same thing on the other side of the world. They got the same thing going on. They, they got careless here. Look, one, two, three, four, five of the same formations replicated right there. These two replicated, same exact formations right here. Um, this right here is, is clone of that right there. I mean, really? So you're telling me that we could take pictures of Jupiter and Saturn, huge, massive planets, and now we're out going to Pluto, but we don't have one legitimate picture of the Earth? From space that's not a composite click on this picture right here supposedly the same mission same guys that took the picture of the most famous picture of our earth i'm going to do save image as and let's see apollo moon let's call it apollo moon 17 and i'm going to open that in photoshop and if those of you think this technical difficulty was planned and think i'm scamming you go do it for yourself <laughs> Because you're going to find the exact same thing. i got nothing to hide here. This is live on the air, okay? I'm going to zoom in on the Earth in Photoshop. You see the Earth? Go to Image, Adjust, Levels. And I'm going to 
the levels over here. And I'm gonna bring the levels up. Uh-oh, what is that? Why is there a square box around the Earth allegedly taken from the scientists on the moon in Apollo 17? And people wonder why I don't trust NASA. That's why I don't trust NASA. Just another example of NASA faking space. Let's take a look here at this supposed image of Jupiter. Nothing more than CGI fakery. The supposed auroras towards the north. Let's take a look here. Again, at NASA's official website where it states Hubble captures vivid auroras in Jupiter's atmosphere. Here's the problem. The date of June 30th, 2016. Now take a look at this. Another so-called official image of Jupiter. This one's from back in 2014. You see the problem here? Now let's take a closer look at the supposed two images provided from NASA of Jupiter. Here's the problem again. 2016, 2014. What's the difference here? Well, the difference is they added the supposed auroras on the north, and this is nothing but a Christmas tree. Give me a break. Take a look here. I mean, all the clouds are in the same exact position. Just the 2016 image is a bit, I would say, darker. This is a bit lighter in 2014. Here's a side by side. I mean, people can't see what's taking place here with NASA. Nothing more than fakery. I mean, give me a break. This is, com this is a complete insult you have a brain in your head and you can tell it's real because it looks so fake honestly <laughs>
In this next segment, I'm going to show you how NASA grabs objects in 3D space, rotates them around, manipulates them. They can do this with water, with cloth, anything. And the cool thing about it is we can take what they're doing, what they're seeing with their contact virtual reality augmented lenses and put that on a separate video layer live. Yes, live. And do it all in real time. Oh, 45 minutes straight of NASA messing up the virtual reality setup. I tried to pick some clips that were obvious and some not so obvious. Uh, show you some of the contacts. We're going to see um, Tim Peake with his contacts in, but these are virtual reality contacts overlaid on the eyes so actors can interact with things in 3D space all in real time. In this next shot, we will get to see the whole arm setup and the virtual reality glove that covers all the way down the arm and hand. This allows the software to broadcast what we see video wise as his arm in a shirt sleeve. Okay, I have a lot of Tim Peak screw ups, but this one here, the system glitches, the software does not track his hand properly, and Tim slips his hand underneath his other fingers, which is tightly holding onto the mic, which would be impossible. Um, I don't think this is Tim's fault. Normally, Tim always moves his other fingers up while he slides his hand under. I just think the uh, system didn't respond to his movements here. It's, it's virtual reality. He's They're wearing augmented uh, contact lenses so that they can interact with these 3D objects. Now, in this scene, the guy on the left in the green shirt, he thinks he sees an object in 3D space that's being broadcast to him. So he grabs it and he puts it off to the side. He's looking straight ahead because he's looking at an object rotating in front of him. But the video channel is down that is supposed to show the viewers what we're supposed to see. And so we don't actually get to see the object that he has seen. And I would just sum this up as a very terrible, bad, horrible day for NASA doing live feeds. So um, many times during um, spacewalks outside the International Space Station, we can see air bubbles rising up. Can you touch on how there are air bubbles in space? Um, air, can you be more specific, air bubbles? So yeah, like a lot of times during the footage, the NASA footage, you can see bubbles coming up out of the helmets or kind of from underneath you. Um, how do you explain bubbles in space? Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. You might, there's, now sometimes you get water in the helmet and it comes, it's either, it's either uh, you know, from sweat or from the cooling garments. And, um, you know, in some of my spacewalks, I had like water in the helmet, not like I was gonna drown in the helmet, but just little bits of water probably came from uh, sweat. Often um, on the outside of the space station, you'll liberate little pieces of, um, you know, there, it's a really harsh environment out there and the outside of the space station gets beat up pretty good. And sometimes, you know, you'll see just little flecks of paint or something that you might have disrupted floating away from the suit. And, uh, you know, that's generally what that is. I've never seen any kind of air bubble anywhere. Yeah. Could, it, could it be that you're filming in an underwater pool and you're not really out there? <laughs>
Why don't you swear in the Bible that you walked on the moon? You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Call him a kettle black if you ever thought of it. Say that you misrepresented get myself. away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. And then there is this, official NASA research into the dynamics of an aircraft that would function over a flat and non-rotating Earth. A flat and non-rotating Earth. A flat and non-rotating Earth. What? I know NASA has a tremendous multi-billion dollar budget, but why would the organization waste funding research for an aircraft that functions over a flat and stationary Earth? I thought we lived on a spinning globe in space. Is this not like Toyota designing a new car that drives through lava? It would never be used and would be a tremendous waste of money. This is all fun and games until you really start to ponder NASA's lies. Why would the biggest space organization whose vision statement on their website claims that it is their goal to discover and expand knowledge for the benefit of humanity lie. And where exactly does their multi-billion dollar annual budget go? In the last five years, NASA's total annual budget between 2016 and 2020 totals over a whopping $100 billion. Why would they commit such fraudulent actions if they want to benefit humanity with their understanding and exploration of space? And if we cannot trust the most famous of all space organizations to give us the truth, then is the Earth really what we've been led to believe it is? And then I remember the 1959 United Nations Treaty which prohibits and regulates all global activity on the continent of Antarctica and ensures that the continent belongs to no nation. With Gleason's map in mind, I started to wonder whether Antarctica was really what we had been told it was. Was it really a freezing white untouched paradise where, as Sir David Attenborough shows us, penguins play in the snow? Could it really be a huge ice wall encompassing the entire Earth? And then something dawned on me and stopped me in my tracks. How did I not notice? It was staring me in the face the whole time. Gleason's map. Hidden in plain sight in the United Nations logo. Look. The North Pole is at the centre just like Gleason's map. And why is Antarctica missing? Or is it? Upon closer inspection I realised that the logo was framed in a circular laurel. I know from ancient Greek mythology that the laurel leaf came to symbolise Apollo. Apollo again. Just like the moon missions. Hmm. In ancient Rome the laurel was not permitted for profane uses and lighting it at the fires of the altar was strictly forbidden. And I knew from the treaty that the UN had strictly forbidden Antarctica from being explored and exploited. Was there a message in this? I started digging and then I realised that not only did the United Nations have this logo, but also the International Maritime Organisation, the International Civil Aviation Organisation and the World Health Organisation. The Maritime Organisation polices the seas and the Aviation Organisation polices the skies. The World Health Organization controls all health and disease communications and guidance for the world, much like it has during the COVID-19 pandemic. Did the UN's military really police Antarctica with the maritime and aviation, or is it just an arbitrary treaty honouring the last unspoiled place on Earth? Hey, it's a Navy destroyer. He will yield. <laughs> He'd be thinking, that cheeky better not cross my bow. Oh, yeah. Stop, 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 Josh. <laughs> they take they take it seriously. What did they say? You gotta yield, you can't just fucking do they think you're gonna charge them. I don't know for sure, but I think they did some incident. No, they did. They they, um, they come back last call. going around. He's turning, stop, he's turning. He is actually turning. No, he is turning. Fucking hell, what have we done now? It's turning, Josh, just sit still. He's slowed down. Yeah, he's really slowed down. 
Yeah. Not that we were in trouble. It's coming to us. He's got the shits because. We're heading to the shelf to go. today with this Cessna and the Air National Guard. I'm going to be inside of this Cessna and we're going to be going rogue. We're going to fly into that no-fly zone and we're going to see how the Air National Guard does it. They scramble the fighter jets that come right. Take off. We're off. Flying for miles and miles until... Okay, we've just entered the no-fly zone now. Our pilots aren't talking to air traffic control, ignoring their calls to reach them. That triggers an alarm at the Air National Guard base. These fighter pilots scrambling to their jets. They're on alert and ready to take action 24 hours a day. Today, racing to their F-16s, suiting up, climbing on board, and rushing to the runway. Taking off to intercept our rogue Cessna. Reaching the target in just minutes. This is the view from the F-16. That's my Cessna right there. Intimidating as you would think it would be. Look at that fighter jet. He's right off our wing. Another F-16 swooping in on the right, calling us on aviation frequencies. You have been intercepted. If you hear this transmission, go to the radio call and rock your wing. He wants us to identify ourselves. We're a rogue aircraft, remember, for this demonstration, so we're not going to respond at all and see what this fighter jet is. ordered to turn to the northwest. The fighter jet giving us one last warning. After all of this, the pilots still won't listen. The plane won't leave the airspace. Will you shoot them down? If required, we'll execute the rules of engagement per the commander of the North American Aerospace Defense Command. And yes, we would do that. Shoot the plane down. If it meets the rules of engagement, yes, we would to defend the airspace. Why are they policing the parameters of Antarctica in such a vigilant way? Surely they are just protecting the penguins and seals that we've seen so often in planet Earth and frozen planet documentaries. I don't know, I'm not too sure anymore, because after I stumbled across this.
A giant ice wall stretching for what seems to be hundreds and hundreds of miles. I don't know about you but I find this footage deeply disturbing. With NASA's lies in mind and that great ice wall looming in the distance, I began to experience what some call cognitive dissonance. I went into denial. Of course none of this could be true and of course our Earth is a spinning globe as we've been taught throughout our lives. It's one thing NASA lying, but are all the professors and scientists lying too? Is the National Geographic Channel lying? And what about Newton, Einstein, Hawking and Attenborough? Are they lying too? It's a complicated answer and I will do my best to show you the truth. But before we look at the gatekeepers of knowledge and the trusted voices of our world, I need to show you more of our Earth. I don't want to lose you just yet. Come with me to part 3 where we will explore a few ways our Earth could work as a flat and stationary plane.